I'm always a woman, you know. Uh, I never leave being a woman. So, so that shows one way or another in painting. But who is a woman? I really like working alone. I like being able to be in the studio, and nobody here, put on the music, you know, and create an envelope of time and space that's just between me and the painting. You know, what's happening there and what's happening there. And it's a, and it's a conversation that you have with your painting. Always, because you put something down and it tells you something that you didn't know before you got it down there on the canvas. And then you get it down and it's there and it talks to you. And it tells you what else you need. <laughs> if I didn't have my art, right, what would I do? <laughs> what would I be? It's part of my identity. So it identifies me to myself. This is who I am. And I'm, I'm part of the main culture, but I am always a woman. And I bring, as a woman, other things to the work that maybe wasn't there before. Some of it uh, is sheer rebelliousness. You know, is, is just... Uh, a kind of confrontation with with life, with with things that are wrong in the world that you want to fix somehow, and that sense of confronting and feeling that you could have to do something, uh, I think, gives you the confidence to push ahead. Part of it, it was a sheer survival instinct of uh, you had to be doing things to survive. Uh, so that pushed you forward. Uh, and I, I don't know that it was just that, but uh, the confidence was perhaps coming from a home where you were nurtured emotionally. Living in Europe, in Madrid particularly, because Spain at that time was still Franco-Spain, that was very much uh, a certain kind of sexual and religious repression in, in that area. I started to understand how many of the things that I had to fight for uh, to survive as a professional woman uh, were really problematic institutionally in the, in the whole structure of society. So I sort of became a feminist there where things were so extreme that you didn't accept them as normal. Whereas in the States, the, th the way we lived, it seemed to me that was just the way things were. It wasn't as if I could see that they needed to be changed necessarily. I thought there was something wrong with me that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, feel comfortable uh, being myself under those conditions. So that was the background that, that forced a kind of change. And then I returned to this country right at the time when the women's movement was really coming into its own. And that was very important for me because I came with my consciousness already raised. I didn't need to sit through those kind of uh, consciousness raising uh, sessions. I understood what all that was about, how things needed uh, to change right from the very beginning. And I felt that the change needed to start in the sexual area. And uh, so they were political meetings, essentially, of, of artists. And there were uh, 
many women there who then split off from the main group. They got tired of being the coffee carriers, you know, for the men. And they realized that the problems that they had were distinctive and different. I think, I think that uh, the artist in uh, Western society, m more here in America probably than Europe, were seen as uh, um, effeminate, right? Uh, they weren't real men in, in a certain sense. They liked culture and they, they weren't the cowboy kind of image. And so that their whole uh, sense of themselves as artists were, had to be defended, their sense of themselves as men. And that men made the culture. That men were the ones who, who uh, women made babies and men made culture. And the whole uh, nature culture kind of dichotomy uh, were, uh, came into play in that. And women were part of nature. You know, they're like beasts, <laughs> you're the breeders, right? So that set up uh, to begin with that whole kind of uh, discrimination against women artists. There was always that expectation that the women would do things that were very feminine and, and, and were, quote, weak, uh, you know, and not, not masculine. The men were the painters who, or sculptors who made muscular, strong, breakthrough uh, work and determined the culture. They had uh, the exclusive kind of right to do a certain kind of muscular painting. And you certainly weren't supposed to make news. And part of that all was about breaking down the canon of what the history of art gave us as the canon of high art. And anything else was craft or not high art. Consequently, if you made painting, you were in, why are you competing in their territory? It's their territory and we don't want to deal with their territory. We don't want their territory to be high art. We want our territory to be high art. So it was that kind of thing. And the same thing with the nude. The nude was always made for the male gaze. We didn't have the word the male gaze then, right? But that's what I was dealing with. I, I mean, I was deliberately distracting the nude from the male gaze to bring it into what the female saw. I loved color. I loved being free in color. I only moved away from the color from the abstraction because I was so intent on, on making the image that gave the content that I cared about. And as I started to work the nude, I needed to gradually make it more and more naturalistic uh, so that it registered the way I wanted it to and not registered as something out of, like, say, German Expressionist art. I always want a painting to have what I call bite you know, to not be too pretty, to not be just beautiful. It has to have an edge of some kind. When, when you worked on something that you couldn't make it happen and suddenly you find the way. And you say, oh my God, look what I did. Isn't that wonderful? And that's the pleasure of it, the, the magic of it. It's always magical. I mean, I want uh, to have an aesthetic experience. I don't want to be deliberately ugly, right? But like I say, it has to have some provocation in it. That provocation for me is not uh, grotesquerie. What I want it to be is about that image, you know, and that the image registers. Mm -hmm. 
And that's the aesthetic experience, really, rather than, than the literal experience. So uh, in terms of the kind of thing that, I, that I've worked with, there's always the content, but it's not a narrative content. It's not a content about, oh, look, she's holding a, uh, a camera. And yes, that's there, but it's the image of it not the story of it. Destabilizing the view and the viewer. Who's looking at who, right? Which is part of what I started with in a certain way when I started working the nude, right? So one understood that in the history of art, the whole history of the female nude was displayed for, for the male viewer. I mean, you could never look at any of those paintings. I mean, I don't know how a gay woman might, <laughs> might respond to that, but uh, as a heterosexual woman, I know that those paintings were not for my gaze. So I wanted to make paintings that would engage a woman uh, also and that would be uh, that, the, that the person that is described in the painting was not a passive subject. Uh, and, and so I was very deliberate in, in thinking about that. And of course, I used different devices to make that happen. One was the self-image looking down, then the use of the camera, in the picture, right? It happened accidentally that I took pictures in the locker room that I was doing, and I was in the mirrors. So I used the mirrors, right? But I use what's available, and then I understand how it functions and if it works for me. And I use it because it works for me to do what I wanted to happen, for you to know that when you looked at it, that what you saw in the painting was not a passive subject. It was somebody and something was happening there that was an activity that, that took control of what you saw, not that just allowed itself to be seen. It's always about here I am, you know, and, and uh, that self-determination was, uh, was the intent of the paintings. It was the intent so far as I was concerned, but I wanted it to convey to other women that they, ha they have that same uh, subjectivity rather than objectivity, to become, to become also self-determining. When I used the mannequins, I was also interested in the way uh, uh, the fashion industry and the whole culture uh, um, uh, puts up a model of the female form that is uh, um, arbitrary, to say the least, you know. And, and so I was playing with some of that, of the, the idea of the flesh as it actually is in a human being and the model that one is supposed to conform to. So I have like several paintings of myself with the camera uh, and in the background is one of, one of the mannequins so that you see that juxtaposition, right? So it wasn't so much in, intended as that kind of surreal object you know, that comes alive, you know, uh, the doll that becomes the reality. But it was really more about uh, a kind of mass production of a female form, of a pseudo-female form uh, for which everyone needs to conform. Mm -hmm. and, and men would say, you know, uh, women are all, they're all the same. The total passivity. And, and also, it gives you total control and 
to love, um, to need total control of the thing or the person one loves is a very common uh, kind of syndrome. You take a big risk uh, to follow a dream, to follow what you want to be. And not a lot of men can, can deal with that. You know, they want you to conform to the norms that are uh, um, very much in their favor that your interest should be their interest, not your own. There are just so many different ways that you have to step out to live as an artist. I mean, when I first moved here, my mother thought I was doing something terrible, right? To live, when I was young, to live alone as a woman was something that you shouldn't do. So I was not a good mother. I was not a good wife, right? All of those things. So in every way, you're, you're put into a box of what you can do and what you can't do, you know? And those restrictions uh, become uh, overbearing and change what you're able to do. In, in a very real way, not just because there are external restrictions, they become internal, that you, you internalize those restrictions. And that internalization is crippling. Our disequilibrium has to change. All of those things have to change for women to be different. It isn't just one thing. You know, I think one of the things that has changed is because women work so much, you see men taking care of children sometimes. You never used to see that. You never saw a man uh, move, carrying a baby and uh, pushing a baby carriage. You know, a man wouldn't, he simply wouldn't do that. It was, it was un, unmanning him. So they do now. So they have contact with children now with some of the work that women do all the time. And that changes the way they see the women. And it changes the way the children see the men. And I think young men are a lot more uh, um, open to women as people than they were, they young people. I mean, there's a lot of distortion around sex and uh, pornography and all that kind of stuff. Those are big uh, problem areas, I think. The sexual area is still a big problem. The women have internalized some of male desire, right? so that they don't understand the difference. And they think that as long as uh, it's sexual and they're doing it, it's feminist. And they use some of the imagery that the men have used. They appropriate it. And they don't seem to feel that it is negative for themselves. They're just reacting uh, to the desire, you know, and their way of reacting to desire is by complying and buying into the kind of imagery that, that signifies desire in the larger culture. And they don't understand how those kind of signals are signals that are demeaning to them you know, and or how to create signals that are not demeaning. It's not impossible. It just means that people have to be conscious 
and, and have to work at it, you know? It doesn't just, it doesn't happen by itself. It means people have to stand up and, 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 and push. And if they're not willing to take the risks, well, then they're gonna lose. <laughs> so that's something that we all seem to need, that, that sense of a meaningful life uh, that, that gives one that feeling of, of, of having accomplished something and of being identified with something outside of themselves. Otherwise, you're just into that kind of nuclear family thing that many people are into. And I am very grateful to do what I do because it gives me that, that way of, of having something external to myself that I can uh, identify with and be part of. And art was my way of doing, of doing something. Of, of, of doing something that would matter. That's a way of not dying. <laughs>